Okay, good evening, everyone. You're very welcome to the fourth Ulster GA webinar on the Club, Club Coast Development Programme. Tonight's webinar is titled Fundamentals and Athletic Development, and it will be delivered by myself, Gareth Thornton, and Owen McNichol, who is the Sports Science Officer for Ulster GA. Like all our webinars, this one has been recorded and will be accessible shortly on the Ulster GA YouTube channel. Um, it will be sent out to all attendees in the coming days. And again, like, like, like all of our webinars to date, you know, the, the more you guys engage with us, the more we get out of the webinar. So the chat box function is available um, and you know, we, we will be asking you questions throughout the webinar. So we would, we would encourage you to engage. If this is your first webinar, um, you will see an icon along the top saying show conversation. So to access the chat box, if and when you need to, if you if you click on the show conversation box at the top and you you will then see the chat box function along the right hand side where you can type in any answers. So this is our our, our one on athletic development, fundamental movement skills. The next the next webinar is on the skill of coaching the child, which will be on the fifth of May, which will be facilitated by Joe O'Connor um, from Dublin Coaching and Games. So again, if you haven't yet registered for that, you can register for that via the Ulster GA website, and the registration link will again will be sent out in the coming days. So the outcomes of this evening's workshop are what is athletic development, coaching the fundamental movement patterns, and then how these can be incorporated into our coaching sessions. I suppose when, when we look at this, this is the new GEA play, long-term player development model, and we look at the, the F1, F2, and F3 phase where we have circled in white. So this is probably the space that the people on the call are coaching in and where we're looking at sort of fundamental movement skills and we're looking at nursery programs, under seven, under eight, under nine type of stuff. So the F1, we're learning and acquiring basic movement, and F2 is the extension and refinement of basic movement. So as coaches, are we providing our players are, are, with with these type of movement skills, are we are we putting our players in these environments and training where we're going to try and enhance their movement skills? So this is probably the space that that the coaches on the call are, are probably working at, at at this level. Okay, so in the chat box, um, I'm going to play this video. I'm going to play it twice for you. I just want to see can you recognise any movements, and if you can, can you type them in the chat box? Okay, so listen, great with some 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 very good answers coming in there. So agility, jumping, core, jumping and landing, side stepping, balance, jumping off either foot, jumping, running, flexibility, change of direction. So brilliant. Listen, pr probably all of the movements that that Owen and I identified whenever we looked at this and, and looked at how how this video would link into to what the topic of this evening is. So as coaches, and again, I'm not going to ask you to, to answer this question. You can answer it to yourself. As a coach, do you provide scenarios or opportunities in training for your players to perform all of them movements? Okay, so if the answer is yes, brilliant. And that can be done in lots of different ways, through warm-ups, through games, through different types of activities. If it's a no, as a coach of this fundamentals um, age group, I'd be encouraging you to definitely say, well, how can I integrate these type of movements into, into my sessions? And then more importantly, how can I upskill myself in learning the coaching cues and the coaching points of all these movements? Because it's one thing letting the kids and letting your players do the movement. It's another thing being able to coach the movement or be able to maybe spot if something's going wrong or a player's jumping or landing incorrectly and then going in and providing a coaching intervention if and when necessary. But hopefully at the end of this session, you, you, you'll have a couple more tips on some of the coaching interventions and the coaching cues. 
So the next slide here, we just have physical literacy and the fundamental movement skills. So if you look at the locomotor movement skills, body control skills and object manipulation skills. So all of all of the, the three different circles, I suppose, they're all slightly interlinked because as a coach, if you're coaching, coaching one, you probably can't coach one without the other. And at this fundamentals, at this fundamentals age group, it's key again that we're exposing our players to all these type of things. So if you look at the locomotor skills, you're running, you're jumping, you're landing, crawling, sidestepping, skipping, dodging, evading, moving forwards and backwards, and very, very important, starting and stopping. So again, as a coach at this age group, if you think of the of the age profile of the player, you know, they're anywhere from part of being four to eight or, or, or nine. So as a coach, how creative can you be to maybe sneak some of these movements in, in your session? You know, how can you make them fun, which is paramount at this age group? You know, and you know, can you turn them into races? Are they done in isolation? Are they done in pairs? So again, lots of different questions you can ask yourself as a coach. Well, how can I actually integrate these into the sessions? Your body control skills into your balance on both hands and feet, your change in direction, rolling, twisting, turning, spinning, accelerating, decelerating, bending and stretching. So again, think about the player pathway. Think about you know, how your player goes from, from the child strand into the into the youth strand, into the adult strand, how the game becomes more advanced. You know, it's played at a higher speed, it's more dynamic. So as coaches, if we can get our players used to these movements and these types of things at this age group, four, five, six, seven, eight, get them competent in it, get them moving correctly, you ha have correct movement patterns in place for them. The older they go, the easier they are, the easier transition it should be. And then your object manipulation skills, so you're catching, you're throwing, you're kicking, you're striking, you're striking, you're dribbling, bolo, bouncing and soloing. So again, as a coach, how do we get these into the sessions in a creative and a fun and innovative way, you know, that, that that's keeping our kids engaged? And probably, again, at this age, we're probably looking at the bilateral, the bilateral movement and the bilateral control. So we're working on our right side and our left side. You know, again, any of our locomotor skills, our body control skills and any of the skills with the object, that is very, very important. We're exposing our players to using both sides of the body. Do you want to take control of our own and work away? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, so, just moving on, um, we're just going to delve a wee bit more into athletic development, um, what it is, uh, examine some more of the, the, the call them the movement patterns. All right. So, rather than just thinking about specific exercises that you can prescribe or certain activities, we're going to look at more patterns of movement uh, and then how that can underpin what happens in sports. So say, for example, a squat pattern, uh, you want to see probably a good squat pattern if uh, some of your children or players are doing a, a landing position from like a, a jump, say if they caught the ball uh, from a standing jump, are they able to land safely and effectively um, before moving off in whatever different direction it is. So we're going to look a bit uh, at what they look like, um, some of the coaching cues that you might uh, give to your players. So for example, are the internal or the external cues? Uh, a lot of the research that's coming out now at the minute is saying that external type cueing um, is more effective uh, in terms of force production uh, and power output from uh, whatever exercise or activity you're trying to do. So we'll talk a wee bit more about what internal is uh, versus external cueing. Uh, and then we're just going to explore a wee bit more around the, the different types of training methods that you can develop these. Uh, but all in all, what we're thinking about as a whole, athletic development is a long-term uh, development of the player from right from the fundamental stage group right up into senior. Uh, but with the main aim of trying to reduce as many injuries as possible, but maximising uh, athletic potential. Now, maximising athletic potential is obviously going to be different for male, female, for eight different types of age groups, for different types of heights of people. So we'll take all of this into consideration. But the younger that we can get our kids uh, involved in some sort of structured athletic development pathway uh, and that shows progression over a number of years, uh, the better output that we're going to have uh, long term. So I think it's key for yourselves and coaching the club and especially at this level to try and ingrain as much of these uh, movement patterns uh, as you can, but also have it in a fun and playful environment. So it's not just uh, the common 
uh, every night and they know we're going through drills upon drills. You want to implement as many games, keep them wanting more uh, and have it as fun as possible. So when we talk about athletic development, here's just a, a, like a generalized um, definition uh, from Vern Gambetta. So we'll talk a bit about it. It's a systematic, sequential and progressive development of all athletic qualities in an integrated manner to develop the complete athlete. It incorporates a balanced development of all components of physical performance, strength, power, speed, agility, endurance, and flexibility. So just like I was talking before, it's progressive in nature. You don't just start with some of the high-end uh, activities. And again, you have to think about our children aren't many adults, and you don't want to treat them that way. You want to make it as fun as possible, but you have to make it as basic as possible and talk on their level. That's one thing that I find with uh, being a physical literacy coach as well, and Garth will know as well that when you go into a school environment or a young environment when you're coaching you have to be very aware of your, your audience uh, how they're going to perceive what you're saying so some of the cues I may give to a senior player would be a lot different than I would give to uh, an underage player or some of the fundamental age groups so keep that in mind but we will talk about uh, different types of strength uh, you can develop how you can develop speed uh, and agility and then we'll just talk about the jumping and landing uh, towards the end and then we'll try and Give you some good ideas that you can incorporate into your session in terms of your games and your activities you can do. So when we look at the, the fundamental movement skills, primarily these are the ones that we're going to, we're going to focus on. Uh, agility, balance and coordination, which you probably know more from the fundamental age group as the ABCs. Uh, also we're going to look at the RJTs as you run and jump and throw in, and then incorporated in along with that is the, the kicking and striking and the catching and again. Those are all types of activities we should be embedding into training sessions, but we'll talk a wee bit more about the, especially the running, the jumping, the, the landing type of exercises that you can uh, incorporate into, especially warm-ups, so you can pepper them in just when you need. They're not going to be the mainstay of your session. They're coming to the, your, your Gaelic football or hurling sessions to play Gaelic and football, so you just want to make sure that you're giving them enough you give them enough coaching cues, you give them enough uh, activity level from this so that they're going to develop in the long term aspect, but it's not going to be the main emphasis uh, of your sessions. And whenever we talk about this coordination and movement efficiency, this should underpin everything uh, that comes before it or comes after it. So I'll try and use an example from this, this uh, diagram you can see. We want to have coordination and movement efficiency uh, before we develop strength and force production, before we develop speed and explosiveness. If you can imagine, you may have a, a Formula One engine in a car, all right? Highly explosive, lots of speed, but you put it into a small wreck of the car that can't handle that. Well, then what's going to happen long term? It's going to break down. Uh, so essentially, that's, that's what may happen to some of our athletes if we don't coordinate and get the movement efficiency uh, where it should be. Um, again, what I'm thinking about in terms of athletic development, um, these type of uh, movements need to be ingrained because if you can think about, uh, you could have a, a Usain Bolt athlete, very highly speed and explosive, lots of strength, but if he is producing the force uh, at different angles than where he should be, if his knees are pointing in, well then that's power that's going to be lost uh, and effectively that speed that's going to be lost over time as well. So we need to make sure that this movement, the speed movements, the jumping movements are all coordinated in the right fashion. So A, they don't produce injuries later down the line and B, you're not losing out in force production. Essentially you're going to make them faster, you're going to make them stronger and more powerful. And again, and you can see here from some of our local GA athletes, we're talking just about some of the some of the types of speed we're going to be talking about later on. So this guy here is a more an accelerated uh, stance, whereas their Tyrone player here is a bit more of a, a top speed stance. But effectively, what they're doing, uh, they're trying to produce as much force through the floor in the correct manner as possible. We'll talk a wee bit more about you know, different types of angles, different types of cues that you can give. But essentially, we want our athletes to be as fast and as efficient as possible in a safe manner. So Gareth, you're going to jump in here. Yeah. Um, so guys, just we're going to play. We're going to play a quick video for you here. And um, in the chat box, if you could just identify any types of jumping and landing that you see. Um. So again, it's a short video. We'll play it for you a couple of times. 
So in the chat box, if you could identify any types of jumping and landing that you see. So one there coming in there, going out feed back to here. So a frog hop, a one foot to one foot jump, um, single leg jump, brilliant. So again, at this age group, we're trying to tend to develop that single leg stability and strength. One legged jump, two foot jump, a jumping and landing with two feet, a squat landing, excellent. Hop jump, skip jump, one footed landing, two footed landing, brilliant. Good stuff. Okay. One leg, think, two feet. So work we're getting a fair idea just from the feedback that we're getting there. I think everybody's in the, the right lanes in terms of uh, the different types of jumping. We're talking about different uh, combinations that we're using one to one, uh, two foot, some people jumping and spinning. Uh, again, these are things you have to take into consideration. And if you expose children to this, these types of activities, at a young age group and at various types of jumps and lands at, at a different age group, well then once they get older, at least their body should be a bit more climatized to what it's going to feel like and essentially uh, be able to absorb the, the sort of forces that will be once they start to get older and their body gets a wee bit heavier and they're just more force um, through the ground. So as somebody uh, mentioned there, we've got the double leg jump, so that's two to two, two feet to landing on two feet. We notice the other one there, a single leg jump to a double leg land. Uh, we're looking at some people were doing it sideways. Okay, so you've got a, a sideways single leg jump to a double leg land, uh, a double leg jump to a single leg land, a uh, double leg jump to a single leg lateral land. So again, we're jumping from two and landing on one sideways. A uh, single leg hop to a single leg land. As somebody said there it was one to one. Uh, and then a single leg la uh, sideways hop to a single leg land. So those are just a, a few combinations from jumping. Um, again, using different combinations from feet, uh, legs. Uh, but can anybody just identify from the list there, from top to bottom? Would anybody want to hazard a guess as to why you would kind of nearly phase them in uh, in that pattern or that level? So. Double leg jump to double leg land would be one of the starting ones. Why would we start with those type of jumps? Yeah, so somebody's coming in there, order of difficulty. And yet that's a it's a pretty pretty good one. Yeah. So doing a sideways jump from single leg to single leg would be you know it would be hard enough for you know somebody at the fundamentalist age group to do. Uh imagine, yep, less impact, less stability, balance. But overall, yeah. But, and it's safer. That's one of the main things you got to think about. You don't want to be putting your children in too an exercise that's it's too advanced for them. Uh, and essentially, what we're trying to do is create safer athletes who can take the load over a progressive amount of time. So yeah, some really good information comes in there in the chat bar. Keep the engagement going through the, the rest of the activities because we will be asking uh, a few weeks to to uh, answer a few questions. So, yeah. Oh, and just a, yeah. Sorry, Owen, just a, a quick observation. If somebody somebody's commented there a squat landing, you mentioned in, in one of your previous slides about the sort of the language you use or, or keeping it age appropriate. You know, in terms of using that terminology with this age group. Is that a good thing to do, or how you get that mesh to cross? Because essentially, it's a squat pattern you're looking the players to get into. Yeah, just kind of what it was I touched on earlier on was the kind of language that you use. So, if I was starting to say a senior age group, yeah, they would be able to understand, you know, what a squat pattern is and what it should look like. But if you go to a child at that age, you know, you tell them to, to squat and have their knees bent and you know to, to have their hips over their heels, um, they might look at you as if you're talking double ditch. So. Again, you have to think in their level. You have to think in what they can imagine in their head. So say if you're, for example, I want you to imagine that you've got a football um, below your bum and all you're doing is you're just going to sit down and imagine you're sitting on top of the football, but you're going to hold it there. So again, they've got that inside their head that, right, I'm going to sit down really on top of the football. So automatically they're getting into a good squat pattern. And again, if you see anything else that's safe that their head, they're looking down to the ground, uh, you maybe so rather than tell them to get the chest up uh, and head up, you might tell them to look up to the sky. Okay, so that's another external cue that they're giving them. So that's uh, again, it's very important to, to talk in their language, get them to understand. But 
Uh, as we talked about, that squat pattern uh, will kind of underpin a lot of the other things that we'll do in terms of jumping uh, and agility as well. So getting them into a good bilateral uh, squat pattern is essential uh, and, and talking in their language that they know exactly what they're talking about. Well, when you mentioned the ball there, is there any other activities that, that you, would have, you would have carried out in schools or in club sessions at, at this age group where you can turn jumping and land it into a fun game using a ball? Yeah, well, um, say for example, if you wanted to do uh, uh, a long jump uh, game, you had to maybe have all of your uh, players lined up in a line and you'll maybe shout go. Uh, you know, from holding the ball, and everybody takes a standard long jump with the ball in their arms. Um, maybe you want to do it over one, two, three, four, five jumps, and then have a bit of a competition to see who can jump the farthest. And you'll find out once they have the ball in hand uh, that they may turn to be off balance. They may, uh, if they were doing a, a broad jump or a standing broad jump, they may have their arms out in front to help them balance rather than have to have the hold of the ball. They may then have to use the stability that they have within the legs a bit more, so it could be a bit more challenging. I would probably start off without the ball, stand and long jump, and then implement the ball in, or you could have a stand and long jump throw. Uh, again, you're developing a wee bit more upper body power as well, and it creates a wee bit of competitiveness uh, within that wee age group, you know, just to see if you can throw the ball the farthest and jump the farthest at the same time. So what about yourself? Have you any ideas in terms of games or anything through... Yeah, probably if you're looking to focus on this, suppose if, if you're looking at your jumping um, and probably a, a skill that we that it's probably difficult enough for the coach is that overhead catch with this age group because they probably find that the you know the hand eye coordination, the probably the run, the take off, the jump, the hand eye coordination to try and catch the ball and land, there there may be a bit too many too much in that for them. So you know if if you had them in twos, um, and you had you know the player A holding the ball out at the side at the highest point. And player B then has to run and try and jump and catch the ball off that player's hand. You know, as we game called pick the fruit. So, you know, they're running around and they're picking fruit. But the focus is on that jump. You know, is, is, you know and some of them, the, 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 the beginner level will have that, the, the two foot jump and probably two foot land. And you're looking then to progress it on where they're taking off on, on one leg and then maybe they're landing on two legs, you know. Um, progress it on in them when they land they maybe have to have a turn and, and go a different direction for the more advanced ones and then I suppose turn, turning it into a game um, you know once you catch that ball or once you take that ball off your partner you hand it back to them and you run to someone else and you jump and catch another ball and you know you set the clock on for 30 seconds um, how many many pieces of fruit can you pick in 30 seconds and that adds a wee bit of competitiveness into it but the focus still should be on jumping landing and then the catch you know, so prob- probably a-, a decent enough one that one on that's simple enough to set up, um, and they get loads and loads of opportunities to do it. It's fun, and it adds a wee bit of competitiveness into it as well. See, Vincent just come in there jumping over the river when doing the high catch game. Another good one. Yeah, you're trying to emphasize the the long jump, um, and again you're giving them that external cue, and the imagination starts to go that they are actually jumping over a river too. So again, you're picking up with that fun environment too. So good. Okay, we'll move it on then, uh, and we're just going to touch upon, you know, as you as coaches, and you know, if you might see something that just doesn't look right within, you know, doing a wee bit of jumping and landing, because uh, I know for a long time we would have coached the jump, but maybe not as coached, you know, how to land and how to land effectively and safely. So this is something that you probably need to be thinking about a bit more. That you know, come, you know, they're minors or senior age group you know if they haven't been taught to land properly and safely you know you're into dangerous territory in terms of you know they think of a 13 or 14 stone fella who's coming down from the air trying to catch a ball and lands with his knee buckling in whereas if we can coach that they're landing safely and moving off in an effective manner well then hopefully it's going to eradicate a lot of the, the ACL type injuries uh, later down the line but just some common coaching errors that you might see uh, within your sessions, you can just, you know, maybe spot and fix, give them a couple of EQs to look at. Um, so as you see from the outside, the two outside pictures, you've got feet, knees pointing straight ahead, knees over the toes, and feet are hip distance apart. Okay, so just by looking at that picture, that you would know that it looks safe, you know it looks 
balanced, uh, you know it looks in a nice alignment. Uh, and again, from the side, you can see the hips are over the feet, you can knees over the toes, everything looks nicely balanced. Uh, whereas the middle picture, you're looking at knee valgus, we call it. Okay, so if you think that you're coming from a landing position and the knees start to buckle in, and that's uh, a common trait that there's something they probably haven't been taught uh, the correct combination or the correct technique for landing, uh, or else it could be an underlying issue such as uh, strength, um, which is uh, causing them to knee valgus like that. And again, we'll talk about in terms of your coaching. Be effective when you're coaching in terms of being like a 360 coach. Or there's a lot of people talk about 360 degree coaches. So you're looking at it from different angles. And it'd be good practice for you as coaches to get around and see from different sides, you know, front side, back, you know, just how everything's looking. Because you might be looking straight ahead, straight ahead at somebody and think, yeah, that looks good. But you might actually turn to the side and see something that might be totally different. Okay, so again, whenever we look at the the single leg, so again, this comes into running as much as it does for jumping. Uh, knee alignment is key, uh, and you want to have that knee as in straight line as possible. Uh, with call hip, knee, and ankle alignment, so a straight line as possible between that uh, those three, uh, and you can see the picture on the right. Obviously, the knee valgus, and this will be you know this, with the more single leg stuff you do, the more it will be you know, evident uh, in comparison to the double leg, all right? So if you can land on a, a double leg, it might be as evident, whereas if you could put them into a single leg jumping and you'll see a lot more knee valgus, well then uh, that's probably you as a good coach being able to see that or produce that type of a jump and say, well, uh, I thought there was a bit of, there's something, you know, just not right with your jump and landing, but I'm going to put you onto a single leg pattern now, and yet that's definitely showing up. So then you as a coach then can make that intervention and say, well, here's an external cue for you. Um, can you uh, keep your knee pointing out the gate uh, whenever you're uh, landing? All right, so as you're landing forward, you want your knee to be pointing out the gate. Uh, whenever you land, it's pointing over to the sideline. What I want you to do is make sure it's pointing straight down the pitch. All right, so it gives them that cue. Uh, something else, because if you talk to them uh, that I want you to you know, bring your knee in line with your hip and ankle, uh, they're going to lose it. Owen, sorry, there's a question just come in there. You may or may have not have seen it. Should players be landing on the balls of the feet rather than the heels? Um, this, well, there's a, there'll be a few different people who will say different things on this. Um, for me, in my opinion, I would be landing. This comes down to nearly like a running pattern as well. Uh, I would nearly be landing with the midfoot and then naturally if if you can think with your moving jumping forwards your natural progression then will be go to midfoot to ball of the foot um, if you create too much of a heel strike in action uh, it sends like a, a direct shudder uh, right up through up into the hip and that's where you could potentially have the likes of knee jarring or hip jarring but you want to make that impact uh, as nearly as soft as possible so rather than too much of a heel impact there may be a slight heel impact but it, it would be very very minimal whereas the most of the the impact you want to have would be like a midfoot and then the natural progression with that would be just to roll onto the the forefoot um, and then from that there just all depends on the direction of travel from that if they were if they were uh jumping straight ahead uh, or straight up um, i would be saying would probably more slightly more heel contact to midfoot and then onto the ball of the foot uh, but if it's in a forward moving pattern it would probably be more midfoot than to the, the ball of the foot if that makes sense will that answer your question Brian okay so we'll just move on so we touched upon the jumping and landing and now we're going to look a wee bit more at running so these kind of actions are fairly well interlinked uh, in terms of you know, how we cue safely and safe manner, but also being able to try and get the, the most coordinated movement to give you the best output. Uh, so here we've got four different types of progressions or regressions. First of all, what I would do with our young players, or whatever, would be get a good arm movement. All right, notoriously this would be one that would be very hard to coordinate uh, once speeds start to get faster, or once we're 
moving off from like a really fast high accelerated position. So try and get into a good moving pattern uh, in, in the upper body, first of all, before we move the, the lower body. So we get them into a seated march and focusing on that arm movement, hip to lip or cheek to cheek, some people like to use. Uh, again, it wouldn't be too you know, over critical about arm angles. All you're trying to get, again, we're talking about external cueing, is they can think about their hip and they can hip about, think about their lip. So those are the two external things that they're trying to focus on, not about whether their arm is staying at a 90 degree angle, not whether it comes through and stays at that 90 degree angle. If you can just tell them to have an arm, they can make sure their arm is slightly bent, but they're just trying to go hip to lip, you know, that will get the that will get the effectiveness that you're, you're needing. Once you find that everybody uh, has a good movement pattern in the upper body, then you would com use that combination along with the, the lower body and get them to stand and marching on the spot. And again, try not to be too technical with it because if you do be too technical, you'll end up losing them. Get them to focus on somebody marching, marching in the band, you know, with high knees. All right, so they're marching on the spot. Uh, and again, you might need a spot to fix. You might need to tell them to stop, you know, get their arm movement going uh, and then slowly build up the, the high knee. Uh, but again, you want that to focus on alignment, everything's going in a straight line uh, and you want to coordinate it so it's opposite arm and opposite leg. So then we've moved on, then we're going to move off in a forward walk and uh, march pattern. Uh, and again, you're just trying to develop that on from that standing march or walk and march to something more and a bit more locomotion as Gareth touched upon. So arms and legs still doing that coordinated movement, but in a forward movement pattern. And then we're going to build up the pace to that. So this is the stage here where you start to find what things will maybe start to break down. If it does break down, then I would regress it back uh, until they have got that effectively. And then just start to bring in the more advanced stage uh, as you go through. But Notoriously, if it does break down, you go back to the next one. If you can't get it, go back to the next one and just build it up and build it up as as and when you need. And you know, some kids will be you know well on with it. Some kids will maybe need to sit down and just you know that's up to you as a coach on uh, how you uh, do that effectively. Um, but all along, all the way through this year, you're just trying to focus on good technique, good alignment, and good coordination. And a good external cue for this year, once you get up to the top top end speed, what we call it, um, running as fast as they can for as long as they can, would be to hammer the nail. So if you could imagine the leg is the arm and the foot is the hammer, uh, all what you want to focus on is, or get them to focus on, is that they're trying to hammer a nail into the ground. So if you can imagine you're tapping a nail with uh, that's you know really close to the hammer, really close to the nail, it's not going to go in very far. Whereas if you swing the hammer from high, uh, you're going to get a bit more of an impact, a lot more force. Uh, and with more force, then it will become you know, more uh, accelerated speed environment. So, uh, but obviously, as I said before, as you start to develop this uh, and you start to increase the speed, that's where things maybe start to break down in terms of coordination, movement, and again, regress it if you need. So. My cue for that is hammering the nail, um, and a hammer is as hard as you possibly can, so the more force, the more speed. So that would be more what we call like top top speed running, top end running, you know, in full flight. You can imagine they're up nice and tall, and they're going really, really fast. Uh, for this one here, you're probably looking at from an acceleration point of view. And to look at this, you may be thinking, oh, that's very advanced. You know, you probably wouldn't be doing that until you're maybe minors or senior level. But again, it's like everything else. The more you ingrain it into your warm-ups, the more you ingrain it into your coaching sessions, the more efficient they're going to be whenever they uh, get to, you know, that older age groups. And as you can see here from the coach, he's trying to get the, the athlete or the player into a good and acceleration position. And that acceleration position should be like in a forward lean. So if you could imagine uh, like a sprinter out of the blocks, um, he's going to stay as low as he possibly can, uh, up to maybe 40, 50 metres before he comes into the one we were talking about early on, which is that top end tall speed position. Whereas this one here, it's a lot different. You want to stay low. Uh, the leg action will be more like a piston action. Okay, so it's... Uh, short and choppy and fast whereas if you can think about the top end speed 
the legs will be touching the ground a lot quicker, whereas you'll be putting a lot more force through the ground in this one. So some of the exercises you maybe do uh, in this one will be like a wall march at an inclined position. So they're leaning up against the wall. They're doing the exact same marching that they were doing in the last exercise. Uh, then you could progress it on to do a one touch. So they've got one knee up um, and this coach is going to cue him here. So he's got the one knee up high and one touch is just touching the ground once and then resetting on the same side. You might do two to three, uh, then you'll develop that on to maybe do two touches. So they go one, two, touch the ground, reset again, one, two, and a fast pace. Then you might need to develop that on to like a two point start and a two point start is just how many points of your body is touching the ground at one time. So a two point start would obviously be your two legs, but you want to make sure that you're still using that incline position okay so you're not starting from a tall position you need to accelerate before you get into the top speed position uh then you might want to go into a three-point start where one hand's touching the ground okay so and then develop that on further into various starting positions and one thing that always comes to mind in this year like whenever we're playing field sports like gaelic football and hurling you will you know players will find themselves in unnatural positions than they would do than if they're in their like drill setting or if they're like on a track setting. One thing that comes to mind was uh, in a county final um, last year at the senior age group, one player was past the ball uh, while he was on his knees on the 45 metre line. He was able to get up um, out of a kneeling position, twist and get into the accelerated uh, 45 degree angle position, beat two players while he was doing that and then stick the ball in the back of the net. Okay, so the more we can develop uh, up to the various starting positions uh, and that's from like one knee into two knees into starting from on your belly starting on your back uh, the more you can expose uh, children to start from various positions there uh, the more ingrained that movement pattern will be once they, they get older but again it's just important not to skip out any of these uh, always go back to the start and develop it through that uh, pathway. And again, my cue for this here would be push the ground away. Okay, you want to generate as much force uh, as you possibly can in a short space of time. Um, and if they can do that, the quicker it will be. Rather than telling them to, you know, uh, I want you to hit your midfoot on the ground uh, and try and rip the grass from below you, or you know, try and make it as external as possible. You want to push the ground away as hard as you possibly can. Uh, and then you know, from that, you'll just find you know, naturally they'll, they'll feel that wee bit much faster. Um, but a good thing for that as well is like using getting down to their language and asking them, asking the players, how did that feel? You know, how did you feel faster? It's not assessed that you do this, you know, for a full hour on a Wednesday night or a Friday night. Again, this is to be peppered in just as part of your warm ups. Once you've done your maybe ball skills and warm up, and you maybe do some. Um, some wee wall marches or up against the gate or whatever it might be, you might develop it on to you know, the one touch the following week, you might do the two touch the next week after that, you might do various start positions then weeks after that, and then develop that into games, you know, make it as fun uh, and enjoyable for the children as you can, uh, and the way to make it um, that way, I, I find that that age group would be just to add a wee bit more competition into it, you know, who can get out to the, the ball the quickest or you know, uh, have two players competing against each other and, uh, you know, throw a ball between the two of them and the first person to get it wins, you know, but always trying to go back to the, you know, the, the good coaching points, you know, like, you know, are you in that accelerated position, you know, are you still leaning forward, you know, are you still pushing the ground away? Um, so, yeah, those are some of the, the wee coaching points, um, coaching cues that you might want to uh, give to yourself and Gareth, do you want to come in? Yeah, just on the various start positions, Owen, what 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 sort of start position would you be recommending, especially for this age group that they could be starting at? I would go back as far as the, the wall march. Um, uh, as I said before, like there's no right or wrong answer here because they're going to have to accelerate, you know, whenever they go to play a wee game, you know. So uh, I would, you know, week one, I would maybe do a wee bit of uh, the first one in your warm up, and the second week, I would maybe do a wee bit of the second one in your warm up. Um, and again, find ways that you can uh, have um, games or competition in it. So, say the first person to do two two touches or one two touch uh, with your foot, you know, who can 
who can be really, really fast or, you know, uh, as I said before, like have wee games, you know, get them into different positions, you know, have them lined up along the, the end line, have four or five balls out, have them kneeling, uh, facing away from the ball and then, you know, shout, you know, whatever colour it might be, you don't have to get out and touch that colour. Uh, so, yeah, just trying to implement as many games or as many fun environments as you possibly can, you know, all the while just trying to get them to, to remember their, their good movement patterns. Would you have any? Go ahead. No, I'm just thinking the various starting positions, is, is, is that sort of using different body parts as well? So, you know, potentially on their belly, on their back, on their bum, kneeling on one knee, you know, standing on one leg, those types of things, but the focus still being on the, the technique. Yeah, yeah. So, so I went back to like I can think of a player that I know fairly well that took a ball in a kneeling position in the county final. You know, so I would expose them to as many different um, scenarios as possibly can. You know, and be creative in the way you do it. You know, have them on their belly, have them in their belly with their hands up, uh, so they're not touching the ground. You know, have them in the the what we call the you know the seated. Um, seated arm swing position you know like we were doing the first one have them sitting there and then tell them to get up into the accelerated position you know and just do, find as many innovative ways as you can because like you know over the years over the next 10 20 30 years of their career you know they're going to find themselves in some sort of strange position to be accelerated out of that they've never been in before and you know and it could be that time that you know mega bricks or it could be the final part of a, a game so uh yeah just as much exposing of the, the different scenarios that could, could possibly happen, yeah. Okay, we'll just uh, scoot on. Um, and again, that would be the kind of progression that we'd like to follow through from the, from the start to the finish. And again, we talked about earlier on, it's the safest way to do it. Um, and it's the easiest, the easiest to the, the most, uh, to the hardest, all right? So this is, you know, anybody could do that. They can lean up against the wall, they can lift their knee up high and just march slowly, you know, one touch fast, two touch fast, you know, so you're making it harder uh, and faster all the time. So we'll just go on to the next one. Uh, again, we just talked about there was common errors with the jumping and landing. I think it's key that we have to talk about this as well in terms of, uh, you know, if you can talk about these and spot and fix and be a 360 coach, like looking around and at all angles and say, if you notice something, like don't be afraid to just pop in and say, you know, you're, something's happening there, like give them a cue to, 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 to try and fix it. So here's just some of the common cues you might find, like if they're trying to, you know, sprint from a stand and start or like trying to accelerate that wee bit. You're looking at some times you might see they might have a, a weak upward arm drive. So essentially what that would be like small and choppy arms, you know, like you, you ever notice uh, some children like whenever they go to run fast, like their arms are down low and by their sides, you know, um, and again, that arm drive, like if one arm is going small and choppy, well, obviously the other arm is going to do the same, but indirectly then, but if you can think about the coordination of your arms, you know, that's going to lead on to what's happening down your feet. So if you've got small and choppy arms, you're going to have small and choppy feet, you know, and the smaller steps, you're probably not going to generate as much force through that, through your accelerated position as you would want. So, and again, if you're looking, you know, from top to bottom, from head to foot, you're seeing that curve, you know, well then that's loss of power. Um, so a cue you might want to give that would be to kind of keep yourself in that accelerated position, you know, keep that 45 degree angle, lean into it. Um, you can see from the arm drive here in the second picture, you get a more of a strong forceful arm drive. So if that arm drive is coming up a wee bit faster, a wee bit more uh, powerful, uh, by the time they get it up there, they're going to have to forcefully bring it back because the other one's coming up. Uh, and because of that there, the, the leg action will indirectly be doing the same. So cue the arms as much as you do the legs. Like I hear a lot of people you know, talking about the feet and the knees. You know, the arms are as much as important uh, at accelerating as the feet are. So they will lead on uh, as much as what the, the feet's doing. So just keep that direct line of uh, posture as well. So you're always leaning in. and uh, You're creating that nearly power line, as they call it, from, from head to the feet. And again, we're just going to move on. We've got another wee video for you. Okay, guys, listen, we're going to play, I hope it's just loading up for us. We're going to play a video, and again, just in the chat box, you see the title there, Agility. Just want you to put in the chat box anything that you observe. So think think of Agility, think of what we talked about earlier on in the, in, in the presentation, and what can you observe that, that's taken place from, a, from an Agility perspective, I suppose.
Okay, so we have a couple of couple of coming in there. So change the direction, turn, change the direction, stop, stop, start, foot position. Okay, very good. Open the body in the right direction for the foot position. Lunge position, yeah, very good. Okay, okay so just uh, from identifying from those from what we're talking about there, so some of you come up with uh, you know, some good points. Um, just going to open up the chat bar here just to begin. Change the direction um, is one of them. When we're talking about uh, agility, a lot of people will you know, assume uh, a, a change of direction is agility, whereas I would kind of my opinion, I would say that they're, they're nearly separate. They're very similar, uh, but I would say like a change of direction would be uh, something that's predetermined. Okay, so if you set out uh, a number of cones, um, you tell a player to turn up the cone, I would classify that as a, an, a change of direction drill rather than an agility drill. Would anybody just want to put into the, the chat bar if they think that they know what the difference between an agility drill and a change of direction drill would be? Like what would agility drill? B to you, how would you see or define agility in comparison to what I just talked about there, your, your change of direction, which would be just, you know, when you go into a cone, you're just going to change your direction. Like how, how would that differ from, you know, agility, true agility? Chris, good. Agility is more chaotic and reacting to a stimulus. Unplanned, that's a good one, Brian. Yeah, so you can think about the goalkeeper. Um, being in that position, you're trying to save a ball, the forward's coming in, he has no clue what way the ball is coming or what way his body has to move until that external reaction happens. Okay, so, yeah, reaction, change the body position, good stuff. Okay, so I think we're, we're getting along the right lines. And, you know, it's not to say that change the direction um, shouldn't be done, it definitely should be. And again, it should be done in a progressive way in terms of leading up to utility. So these are just some of the the ways that I would implement uh, leading up to true agility. So I would do like a, a straight line drill. Um, so it's like a change of direction. So say it's a, a linear uh, forward and back run. So you're, you're going up to a cone, so maybe like a certain type of like a shuttle run uh, where they're having to change, decelerate, sorry, get into the accelerated position, quickly decelerate at the cone uh, and then possibly back pedal. So that's like a linear uh, change of direction. Uh, again, you might want to get them into like a sideways change of direction. Okay, so we're going now the we went linear. We kind of want to go into a lateral lateral pattern. So we're covering that change of direction as well. Again, just laterally moving um, side to side. Uh, moving on, then you might want to implement like a diagonal change of direction. Okay, so this is getting progressively harder, um, putting a wee bit more stress in the body possibly, um, and they're getting down low um, to quickly change off. And if you can think about a forward that's coming in close and goal, you know, he's got a, a forward or a defender there and he might want to take a quick um, quick feet, change the direction at a diagonal pattern. And then if you get into like a monthly directional change of direction, okay, so you maybe have like a star drill or, you know, points in a compass and um, like the player might know where north, south, west and east is and you're maybe giving them, you know, which cue to go to or number of the cones, one, two, three, four, okay, so with the, where there is a wee bit more of a, a reaction to be made, a bit more thought process, you know, they know exactly where the cone is, they know exactly how they're going to turn uh, and that would be nearly classified as like a change of direction in general. We're going to talk just a wee bit more about uh, agility. So. Again, straight line agility. Can anybody come up with um, a, like a straight line uh, agility drill? Okay, so when thinking about reaction, how, th how you have the process, thought process before you quickly change in a straight line. What drill could you do even between you know, two players? You know, how could you get like a quick thought, you know, I have to change direction here quickly rather than, you know, I'm going to change that cone. How can you, what drill or what could what could you come up with um, that might implement like a straight line, linear agility, a quick acceleration, a quick deceleration, um, and it might happen, you know, multiple times. And to a certain extent, you know, it would happen in games. Yeah, so one player shadowing another. I think that's that's that was the one I was kind of thinking on. Um, very simple to do. Uh, 
shadow player movement and checking them. Yep. So essentially, that player doesn't know uh, what way he's going to react. He's basically so. If you say to your players, "I want you to keep uh, an arm's length distance away from each other," whereas I want the uh, the attacker or the yeah, he has to try and evade the player. He has to try and uh, get away from it, but he's only allowed to go forwards and backwards. So he has to try and get as much distance from the player, whereas the the shadowing player has to try and keep as close or as close to one meter as well. So. Yep, that's a good drill that you can do in terms of agility because that player has to think, you know, and react to that stillness, which is this opposite player. And you, as you can see there, you're getting closer and closer to game-like scenario, okay? And again, you can, this is fun, it's enjoyable for senior players as much as it is for children. But if you look through from start to finish, it's progressive in nature and it's getting more closer to what a game scenario would be like. Um, any ideas on how we would develop uh, like a multi-directional agility? And again, if we're thinking about this is at the top is your straight line change of direction would be all kind of closed chain. They know exactly where they're going to. What kind of drill or game could you come up with that would be multi-directional uh, agility based? I'm thinking specifically for this kind of age group, you know, and if we're peppering in these type of activities into our warm up. Um, what kind of agility, you know, activity or game could you come up with in your warm up, which is fun, but you're seeing true multi directional agility being performed? Bulldog, ball tag, yep. And the others? 1v1 player with the ball doing a sidestep, yep. Stuck in the mud, yep. Okay, some good ones, you're thinking about multi directional, you're thinking of moving in all types of planes of movement, forward, backward, sideways. You know, having to quickly turn at 180 degree angles, maybe go off in at 90, maybe go on a curved run, um, and they're reacting to external stimulus. So, again, what comes to mind, yeah, crazy cars is another one. Yeah, they're, so they're trying to avoid. Uh, another one that I would do, especially with that age group, would be like the, the cats and cats and tails, or the likes of your um, cats and mice, or whatever you might call it. You know, where you're having to try and catch as many. Uh, mice with the tails, so you can maybe two or three catchers. So, not only are they trying to evade uh, the catcher, they're also trying to uh, dodge everybody else. Again, dodgeball is another one, they're having to be quick and agile, move their body uh, in and out of certain positions. So, just from the coaching points of view, you know, when we're talking about agility, and you see the coach that we've got in the picture here, he was standing with his feet close together and then he moved them apart. What do you think? What sort of coaching cues is he giving to the players at that point in time before they move off? We're thinking about the body movement patterns, whenever he goes to the players, he starts in this kind of close stance position um, and then he moves to a wide stance position. You know, what message is he trying to get to the players at that time? The boxing stance rather than flat footed, good. Athletic stance. Rather than flat feet, good. So that that's something that I would call like a ready position, and that ready position can be, you know, you're ready to do anything. You're ready to jump. You're ready to accelerate. You go forwards. You go backwards. You're ready to do pretty much any movement that you want to do. Uh, but if we're thinking specifically about agility, and we're just going to play it on here, you know, if he wants to go in a certain direction, okay, so he's in that ready position. What what is our coach now to try to? What's he trying to tell the players? At this point in time, you know, about parts of his body and where they should actually be. Up in the balls to your feet. Good. Yeah. But again, agility, although it is chaotic and it's, you know, something that happens in a, you know, fast environment, I still think to a certain degree we need to be able to, you know, it's a bit like acceleration. You need to be able to coach this in the, the right way. Um, again, pointing in the direction of the travel. You can notice that he actually, actually, external rotates his hip, which he opens out his leg to be nearly in that lunge position. So his lead leg has actually pointing in the direction that he wants to go, which I think is, is key. So rather than trying to push off uh, and your knees pointing forward, but you actually want to turn right, you know, you're creating a lot of shear um, angle at the knee, you know, potential for knee injuries, ankle injuries, you know, you want to make sure that your players are facing in the direction of travel they want to go in, rather than you know, leading with the head, they want to get their body squared up to that direction of travel before they actually accelerate. And it was, something comes into to mind was, 
I, I had a 30-year-old player as part of one of my teams who, at that stage, his motor patterns was pretty much ingrained and trying to coach him out of it was nearly impossible. And he always had this thing whenever he was turning, he was turning, uh, rather than facing the direction of travel that he was going in, he always tried to turn and he created that knee valgus that internally rotated his knee as he was trying to push off until one day in a game environment where one player was coming to tackle and he went to do the same thing. He tried to push off in that internally rotated environment and then done his ACL. So the more we can create good movement patterns and get our, our, our children into you know, the direction of travel, uh, moving in the, the quick athletic stance uh, before they move off, I think that's, you know, in the long term, we're going to, we're going to create um, you know, a more all-rounded, more efficient athlete, but also, again, less injuries. And again, thinking about cues for plant and drive, we talked about them earlier on. The same thing applies in acceleration as those at agility. You just need to get your body squared up into that correct correct uh, direction of travel. So listen, guys, um, probably we went through quite a lot there in terms of our running, jumping, landing, more specific agility stuff. And, and I want to touch on a lot of key coaching coaching cues and I suppose what to observe and then when you observe them, how to coach them. So, you know, we're going to now just go through quickly in, in this one diagram, I suppose, how uh, how this setup is relevant and applicable um, and how you can go through sort of all your agility, balance, coordination, running, jumping, throwing, catching, um, movements and games in this environment. So if you see, you know, we've got, we've got a couple of players on the outside, you have a couple of players in the middle, um, you have hula hoops, uh, small cones, tall cones, uh, hurdles. You know, you could have ladders in there, bibs, footballs. You know, if you didn't have, if you didn't have all the types of equipment, um, you know, you can be creative. And you know, if you have to roll up a couple of bibs, a couple of softballs, tennis balls, you know, what, what socks, whatever it is. But from a from an agility point of view, you know, you're having the children move in and out to all the different pieces of equipment. You know, they're having to twist, turn, change direction. You know, they can move in different directions, different pathways. So they're moving from forwards, backwards to sideways. You know, so all them different things that we're talking about, this is what it looks like in real life. Um, you know, from 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 a coach's point of view, you know, you can you can, as Owen talked about, the, the internal and external cues. You can use the whistle to get them to start and stop. You're then able to observe and coach their starting and stopping position. And just back to the coach in the last video about you know about that sort of stance, the one foot in front, one foot behind. You know, a good base, knees bent, um, knees and toes pointing in the same direction, stuff like that. So as a coach, when you're doing these type of activities and especially your agility, balance, coordination stuff in your warm up, what are you doing? Are you starting and, and, and observing? Or you maybe stand and have a chat with one of the other coaches on what you're going to do for the rest of that session. So it's probably very important that if we do want to ingrain these good movement patterns into our players, that during activities like this that we're observing and we're we're actually stepping in and providing that wee bit of coaching when when we have to. So you know, there's sort of you you umpteen agility agility games you can play here. You know, you can have a call a color that have to run touch a cone when they're touching that cone you know you're encouraging that small step in and then that quick step away and again our, our coaching cues you know your, your head up you know a small step and you don't have to get very technical you know, you could be shouting a number you need to touch three different types of uh three different types of equipment you know again so you're making it competitive you're making it fun you're working on spatial awareness you know you're bringing in your evasion skills your dodge and sidestep and twisting so all them different types of activities can be done through 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 that type of setup and yes you do these more hurling in the hand surely you know there's probably no issue at all getting the hurling in the hand and getting them used to used to doing it so from a from an agility point of view you know but you know if you have the cones there and we've all that sort of cap the, the cap the cone game where half the team if the cones turned upside down the other team have to flip them over again great game you know it's great for spatial awareness great for all for all them types of movements but as coaches do we observe what happens in that in that um in that type of game i suppose if if, if you've played that type of game before we have the cones scattered around and team a are, are turning them upside down and team b are turning them on the wrong or the other way around what generally do we see we see kids taking a big lunge in to try and lift the cone with their head down. They're maybe reaching in with the same same foot and same leg. They're off balance and sometimes they may fall over. Or alternatively, if they don't fall over, it's taking them two or three steps to get up right before they move again. So as a coach, how do we try and fix that? You know, it's a short step, head up, 
you know, if you, if opposite leg, opposite arm. And again, it's just giving those small types of cues that we're actually coaching through these types of movements and not just letting them letting them run about. From a balance perspective, then, I suppose, how do we incorporate balance into this type of a game? You know, you can if to go to a hula hoop and you have to do a balance in a hula hoop, hold it for five seconds. You can set the, t- set the challenge, show me all the different ways you can balance over a piece of equipment. So you could, some kids who are adventurous might go and try and do a balance over the tall cone. Some of them might try and do a balance over over the hula hoop. You know, how many different body parts can you balance on? And again, as long as it's safe and they're not balancing on their head, any body part is is acceptable. And again, we we'll probably you know you think of athletic development and some people maybe you know, mix it up with strength and conditioning and what type of strength work do you do for for this age group? Starting with that, starting with that sort of balance and using your body. As resistance to balance over over objects or under objects, that's that's just really a first step of your entry level into into any sort of strength stuff or resistance stuff. So you know, there, there's different ideas and activities for balance. You know, you have your static balance where, where you're just working independently on your own. You then can go into a wee bit more dynamic stuff where you're working in pairs and a bit of dynamic balance where maybe one and I are partners and I'm in a balance. Owen's maybe trying to push me. You know, just to try and you know, it, it's a, an advancement or a progression where I'm maybe having to react again to, to try to try and keep my balance, which again happens in games. You know, somebody hits the ground and have to bounce back up, and somebody's coming in in on them again. So like that is getting your players used to them type of activities. Um, you're running then again, so you've got your random running, your forward running, your backwards running, your sideways movement in and out through all all the different types of um, equipment. There, how do we turn it into a game? You know, every player's got five lives. Each time you touch a piece of equipment, you lose a life. You know, and again, you're trying then to see you will have kids who will, you know, they'll keep their head down and they'll not look where they're running and they'll they'll, they'll, they'll run into a couple of different pieces of equipment and all of a sudden they find themselves out of the game. You know, so. As a coach, saying you're probably trying to look. Well, why is that player bumping into stuff? Is it they're they're not coordinated? You know, they're they're not keeping their head up or or whatever it is. You know, so it's probably trying to provide that player with that 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 coaching cue or intervention to try and improve that. From a jumping and landing perspective, then you know you've loads and loads of jumping and landing opportunities through this type of activity. You can run, jump, land in a hoop, jump over a hoop. You know, take off on one foot and land on on two feet in a hula hoop. Can you jump over a cone? You know, then we talked earlier, somebody mentioned about the squat landing. Can you jump over the cone and land in the hula hoop in that squat position? Obviously, without using the word squat, you're just asking the children, can you touch your bum off the grass without using their hands? Um, you know, so again, lots and lots of jump and landing activities can be done or games can be done in, in this environment. But again, as coaches, are we observing and then look and then correcting technique? Strength activities, and I suppose you're, you know, like that, your squat where you're trying to touch your bum off, different activities. You go into your lunge pattern, you just, you just set the question to the, to the group, can you touch your knee off a cone? Can you touch your knee off a hula hoop? And if they go into that into that shape, I suppose that, that's your lunge pattern. You know, any type of um, animal, animal crawl, and, uh, moving like animals, so your bear crawl, you know, moving like a frog, moving like a rabbit, any of those type of things that, you know, as coaches at this age group, we should probably be trying to integrate into our warm-ups, but no one in, in, in the background will, we're starting to develop balance here, we're starting to develop some sort of strength. And like that, with all these activities, we can include a ball, we can include a hurl, you can do it in ones, you can do it in pairs, um, you know, so there, there, there's plenty of different ideas just in that setup alone. You know, if you have that equipment, you'll get 12 to 15 minutes of your session with with these age groups just in that just in and looking at that screen and looking at that equipment and stuff you know and you know lots and lots of stuff can, can take place there so one of you anything to add to that um that i may have missed no just those are all great um examples um and again whenever we go down to you know, the brass tacks about the coaches you need to be thinking about being as innovative and uh, coming up with as many different, um, you know, your own types of games, your own types of activities, and you know, think about it from the the, the the child's point of view. You know, they're coming there because they want to have fun. They want to come there and they want to enjoy it. But you know, it's up to you to kind of mix the two. You know, if you're trying to um, balance that between, you know, essentially what you're looking to get out of the session, along with you know, being able to make it as fun and enjoyable for them as possible. So. No, I think that's that's all from me. Yep. Okay. Brilliant. So listen, over to yourself, Owen, there, just before we 
Before we it's just got a, a few take home messages, you know, and I, I think I've kind of reiterated a few times over the course of the presentation that, you know, I think it's essential to, to focus on that movement efficiency and coordination before we start to do, do anything else. And long term, as I touched about, you know, it's we're trying to prevent as many injuries as possible, but um, effectively, yeah, you want you want real, you know, high performance athletes or high performing, you know, for your club to. Uh, but essentially, it's far easier to, to build them up now at this age than it is to try and you know do it at a later age. Because I touched upon, you know, once you get to the age of 28 or 30, it's very hard to get that coordination and movement because it's already pre ingrained in you from a young age. So. Yeah, just try and get into those types of good movement patterns and, and progress it, uh, progress it uh, as you see fit and when you need. Okay, thanks, Owen. So listen, guys, if, if there's any questions, um, we spend just another couple of minutes, conscious of time here, but we spend another couple of minutes, if there are any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat box and Owen, Owen will do his best to answer them. <laughs> um, Oh, and just when we're waiting before something, for, just in case any questions come in, now obviously there's a couple of questions that come in prior to the webinar. So, um, probably one of the ones that come up a couple of times. In your opinion, what age group is is the right age to start these type of athletic development and fundamental movement skills? Well, if you think about, you know, your, your Gaelic starts and your fundamentals happen and around that, you know, four to six age group, you know, like I, I would be thinking, you know, how soon, people would ask how soon is too soon, you know, I wouldn't have any problem sending, you know, my kid to, you know, our fundamentals, you know, if I think he's ready for it, um, socially as well as, you know, physically, uh, because we know, like, you could have a four-year-old who nearly looks like a an eight or nine-year-old, you know, because, you know, but again, you have to take everything into consideration, but, like, if you feel that they, you know, they're ready for it, um, socially as well as physically, um, well then I wouldn't have any hesitation to start it, you know, as soon as possible, you know, and you can start it around home, you know, like just get them to, to do different activities for you, you know, without even thinking, you know, if you could get them to, you know, do lunge patterns or do squat patterns, you know, by, you know, inventing wee games and stuff for them, you know, but again, it all comes back to that fun environment, you know, trying to make things as, as, uh, as fun for them, but, you know, you're just trying to you know, guide them along the right path. Yeah, good stuff. There's a question in the in the chat box here. I'll, I'll take one of them on and you can take the hard one. Um, so, Brian, how long should a typical under six and under eight session last? Listen, probably anything from, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, you know, probably in terms of, 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 of gaining and keeping their attention any longer than an hour, it's probably going to be difficult. But, and even if that is, you know, even if it's a station-based session where you know you're, you're changing things up every two three four minutes but i think probably you know 45 minutes to an hour and um, you know well planned no messing about having your activity set up so that you're not giving them the opportunity to disengage mm -hmm. and that it's just from one activity to the next so um hopefully that answers you um keep is a question in their own what would you do with the 11 and 12 year olds and i assume maybe it's it's in around this athletic development um like in a leg of that capacity, I suppose, with 11 and 12 year, 11 and 12 year olds. Yeah, well, yeah. probably at that age group, you're still looking at a lot of body weight type activities. Um, you know, but probably be too. Uh, the, the, the only external load really that we use with that age group would be maybe a partner resistance. Um, we get them used to, you know, if they go to weekend, you know, field sports at this, state, at this stage, they're going to be coming into contact with some sort. So, Probably implementing some sort of light resistance work with their with partners, you know, being able to resist it, you know, sprint uh, against the partner, or you know, using a wee bit of la lower limb strength, with maybe doing a wee bit of sh uh, shoulder activities or something like that. There, just to, to get you know something that's very very light, but the majority of it's all going to be you know their own body weight. You know, they're going to be controlling their own body weight, coordinating their own body weight. You know, and if they're fit to do that, you know, both with both legs, both feet, you know, would start to challenge them. You know, like you know, and Gareth touched upon like come up with wee games like animals and stuff like that. You can do that with eleven to twelve year olds. Like they still love those type of wee games. You know, and you know creating like different types of races, you know, whenever they're competent and, you know, you know, 
coordinating their movements and they've the good core you know, strength will then could you do like like bear crawl races or something develop that into your warm you know something that, again that they'll enjoy but again it's giving you the you know you know that they're, they're getting you know what they need out of it in terms of like you're developing a bit more speed and they're coordinating the movements just a wee bit faster so i would still look at all the body weight movements uh, with maybe some slight partner resistant work um, at that age group yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Owen. Listen, guys, I think we'll, we'll, if there's no more questions, we'll, we'll call a halt to it. Um, listen, thank, thank you very much for, for your engagement. Uh, hopefully you've picked, picked a couple of things up that you can now implement or integrate into your sessions going forward. Um, as I said, the, the presentation will be made available in, in the next coming days. And listen, if there are any questions, maybe that there are any more information that you, you, you that you feel you need, you can just re reply to the webinar's email address and we'll get back to you with with whatever we can. So thank you very much, guys, and um, take care. Good night. Thanks, folks.